to welcome all of you to this month's Smart Talks. If you are joining us for the first time, Smart Talks is the monthly seminar series of the Smart Network at the University of Alberta. And as many of you may know, Smart stands for Sensory Motor Adaptive Rehabilitation Technology. We are a network of more than 200 professors and learners who have come together from many different disciplines to develop interventions that would improve quality of care and health outcomes, especially for persons experiencing neurological conditions. In today's last Smart Talks of the year, the nine recipients of the Innovation Fund Awards will each give a three minute presentation of their exciting innovation. They will take questions for two minutes after the talk and then questions at the end of the session. The Innovation Fund is a seed fund provided by the Smart Network and its business arm, ST Innovations. The fund supports the development of new innovations and these innovations could be anywhere on the spectrum from discovery all the way to clinical validation. The requirements are that the innovations are developed through interdisciplinary interactions and have identified pathways for future implementation outside the lab. Now, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. This session is recorded. I encourage everyone to participate in the question period after each talk and at the end of the session. You can ask your question verbally and I, I encourage you to do that or you can type it in uh, the chat. Before you ask a question, please remember to unmute yourself and then mute yourself afterwards. To the presenters, please make sure that your slides are open and are ready to share your screens as soon as your time comes up. Uh, please turn on your video when you're talking so that we can um, uh, see you. Um, you have three minutes for your presentation and then you will be cut off. So please make sure that you uh, stick to the time limits. Now, after you're done presenting, please quickly stop sharing your screen so that the next presenter can get their uh, slides uh, uploaded and, and set up. So with that, we are ready to start with our first speaker, and that is Jennifer Bertrand. Jennifer, you are on. Right, thank share you. your screen. Yeah. Thank you, Vivian. All right, I'm just going to start the presentation here. Okay. Okay. So measuring sensory motor behaviors can be very informative, uh, but it's also tricky to try and put some kind of objective measure on how people move. This is how we end up with tasks like this, where we describe, for example, how well a complex prosthetic limb works with a single number of how many blocks can be picked up in a minute. Some folks in our lab and collaborators at their lab have developed really informative measures to describe eye and hand or visual motor behaviors during functional movement tasks. These measures have uh, even been collected from populations like prosthetic users, suggesting their usefulness in a clinical context. We wanted to extend this work further by adding brain data from EEG recordings, capturing a more robust picture of sensory motor behaviors. We called this trifecta lab and we collected semi subject uh, data set of synchronized eye tracking, motion tracking and EEG, uh, which was a novel methodological feat in itself. Importantly, we have some very impressive software uh, developed by some of our own talented folks that allows us to visualize and segment our complicated data. This is what you're seeing here. This is the trifecta lab data represented using gamma software where all the moving body parts and objects are built off motion tracking data and the pink line is the gaze vector built from eye data. On the head is the EEG data. However, while Trifecta Lab is really cool, it could never practically replace the box and blocks task. It's too expensive, time consuming, and technically difficult to administer in any kind of applied or clinical setting. My proposed Smart Network Innovation Fund project was taking this Trifecta Lab task and exploring if we could still get meaningful measures if we used consumer grade hardware and had people drag and drop cups in a 2D computer task. We called this Trifecta Light. 
We had just got this project up and running right before the pandemic started, having collected only some pilot data before in-person data collection uh, became impossible. So this was uh, pilot data that I shared in my June Smart Talk. Uh, but the pandemic has pushed us to explore new ways to get data. And as a result, we've moved to perhaps the most accessible version of a sensory motor assessment task that we could have possibly envisioned, fully online data collection. Uh, though this extreme accessibility means abandoning the EEG component with only a personal computer and a webcam, we can still record and then represent data in powerful ways like our full-fledged trifecta lab task. I'll wrap up here with some pilot data from our Task, uh, collected completely online and analyzed in the same way as the lab data in gamma, where we can see the gaze in pink uh, built using webcam data and the mouse icon movement uh, built using the mouse tracking data. We're excited about testing and exploring the usefulness of this task for sensory motor assessment, especially in consideration of this big shift to telehealth medicine. Uh, the goal of this project was to take this complex data and recreate it with lightweight sensors, but because of the pandemic, we've had to come up with a fully remote sensory motor paradigm, and now we actually have a potential. Okay, we actually have this potential assessment tool that could be deployed across the world and to people sitting at their computers in the comforts of their own home, which would mean this would maybe be more accessible uh, than a box and blocks task, and hopefully more useful too. Okay, thank you. Maybe we're ready to take questions. Thanks, Jennifer. Questions for Jennifer. So I'll start, uh, Jennifer. Uh, what do you see as, um, I like what you've been able to do and how to adapt uh, to the pandemic. Uh, what uh, do you see that you would be able to do as um, uh, kind of the first step to implementation outside the lab beyond what you're doing right now? Um, so we are trying to deploy this now um, fully online, um, but we do still want to, when we are able to get back in the lab, still um, include the EEG component with that kind of lightweight consumer grade uh, EEG. We do think that that's valuable and we do have that kind of really rich data set of 70 subjects doing it in the lab. So uh, that's definitely on, still on kind of on board as well. Uh, but we are quite excited to explore if we can still get some really cool um, eye-hand coordination things that we see uh, in the lab when we're just measuring eyes and movement. Um, can we get those uh, kind of translating into this really kind of really basic uh, computer version of our task? Wonderful, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Eric, you've got a question? Yes, Vivian. Thank you, Jennifer. Nice work. Um, I guess a comment or a question would be, do you have any thoughts around the challenge of synchronizing timestamps with different devices? Because I think timing is going to be very critical. And so syncing that up will be key. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, this was a huge challenge for us uh, doing the lab data set of the three modalities in the trifecta lab. Um, and this was kind of able, we were able to kind of work through this um, uh, using some various software to timestamp that um, and bring those in with kind of the synchronous timestamps. Um, online, we're using a very cool platform um, that has been showing pretty strong um, ability to capture and, and really accurately timestamp using the computer timestamps um, uh, really uh, like upwards of about, we think maybe we can get uh, we can get mouse tracking at about 60 hertz and we can get eye tracking maybe closer to 30 hertz. Um, and so uh, the, the timestamps actually seem impressive in that pilot kind of data I showed that was actually um, just kind of run over the internet. Um, and we can see kind of the alignment of the eyes and the mouse. And it's looking pretty good for what is just kind of a webcam that I'm using right now. Um, okay. I'm going to figuring out where things are. Yeah, so. great. Sorry, guys, we're going to stop, but there'll be time at the end. So uh, please um, uh, stay around. Um, okay, yeah. our next speaker, thank you, Jennifer. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Mochtaba Sharifi. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. okay, hello. The objective of this project is assisting people experience a spinal cord injury and stroke. And we want to make them more independent in their daily living activities. As you may know and can see in this video, 
most of available exoskeletons and robots for this purpose have rigid linkages with high inertia and powerful actuators at discrete joints. So this resulted in safety issues, low acceptability and difficulty of using them. So our solution to this challenge is devel development of an upper limb exoskeleton with soft actuators and soft mechanical structure. And this would be intrinsically safer and significantly lighter and biomechan biomechanically more compatible with the human tissue. So we started to use a McKibben pneumatic artificial muscle, but the challenge is having a nonlinear dynamics uh, between the force, contraction, and internal pressure. So we tested out each muscle experimentally and come up with a modified model, mathematical model, and we finally identified the parameters of this model to have the perfect matching between the experimental data and the model output. A shoulder mechanism is designed as the first version of this system. Different parts were manufactured by 3D printing and machining. A microprocessor and other electrical boards are used as the control hardware and the real-time environment of Simulink is employed as the control software. So obviously we have faced some challenges in the design and manufacturing and control and we resolved all of them over the past couple of months. As you can see in these videos, the initial experiments uh, was on, the, on this uh, version uh, using an EMG based force control. In this way, we can detect the intention of user by analyzing the EMG signal and control the exoskeleton based on that. As a result, we can assist people in response to their small muscle activation and, init and initiate the motion using this uh, exoskeleton. The second version of this system was also manufactured, which includes the elbow motion in addition to two joints of the shoulder. The third version of this system is also designed and manufactured to not only have art, uh, soft actuators, but also soft parts and soft sensor. But we still had an issue due to the nonlinear behavior of the soft stretchable sensor and we identified this behavior using several experimental tests. So different mechanical parts and cups uh, were 3D printed using soft materials. And in, in the next step of this project, we will modify and optimize our current design and also have more experimental evaluations on them. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Mojtaba. Questions for Mojtaba? I'll start for a, with a quick question, Mushtaba. How heavy are these elements? And if they're going to be attached to a person, is that, is that going to be uh, a challenge? Uh, yeah, like our estimation uh, is right now, the, the parts that should be attached to the person uh, would be less than around five kilogram, but we have some, we need some like pneumatic components like compressor and pressure regulators. But in our like first version, like we use a portable compressor, which has less than 10 kilogram together with pressure regulator. So our estimation is like 10 kilogram for those parts, but we can make them portable such that the person can have them in, in his or her like wheelchair or in a backpack or like in a box with wheels. Um, but maybe in the future uh, as the final product, we have to optimize like the design to like to minimize the weight and like the size of different parts. Okay. And do you know very quickly what would be perhaps the first population that you would uh, um, apply this to? Um, like we have some like collaborations with uh, Gillen Rose Hospital, but uh, so we are looking forward to to use it for people with disabilities, including like uh, spinal cord injury or like post stroke ones. Okay. But uh, we are looking forward to use it for like workers that doing like some heavy manual tasks. Okay. That's the other application, but it depends on the requirement in the future. Right now, we've got uh, time for a very quick question. Okay, I just wanted to know how do you interface with the person to give commands to the to the uh, biomechanical or mechanical equipment? Sorry, can you repeat? I, I couldn't hear the first part of your uh, How does the patient uh, interact with the, with the hardware? What, what's the way the person can convey orders to, to the hardware? You mean that uh, where they like, have physical interaction with the hardware? Like 
is the hardware just being guided by the person or is there any like neural connection or anything that tells yeah so yeah, much of much of now that you've heard the question i'm gonna have you respond to that at the end of the talks okay let's do that thank you so much great question bernal thank you for that um our next uh, speaker is Nasim Hajari. Nasim, please go ahead and share the screen. Okay. <clears throat> hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, hello, my name is Nasim, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Computing Science. This project has been conducted under the supervision of Dr. Irene Chang from the Department of Computing Science and Dr. Chester Ho from the Department of Medicine. So what is uh, the problem? The problem is basically for people who cannot move very effectively uh, when they are on bed. So uh, groups such as uh, patients with spinal cord injuries or elderly population. And uh, these group of people are at higher risk of developing pressure ulcer or pressure injuries because of the, um, uh, the blockage of the blood flow. And uh, so basically right, uh, this condition can be life-threatening in its uh, later stages and uh, common practice right now is uh, the healthcare provider basically um, changing the posture of the patients in fixed interval, which of course has its own shortcomings. And uh, in this project, we um, uh, propose a, a, an approach to automatically detect um, uh, posture body from the 2D pressure signal, or as we call it, pressure images. And then uh, basically, uh, detect the different body parts and uh, track the associated um, pressure values over time because uh, pressure also is a multifactorial development and the mo uh, two most important factors are the amount of pressure as well as how long this pressure is applied. So the challenges that we face was the existence of the external objects such as pillows or wedges on the uh, pressure mattress which can be uh, quite common in these settings uh, as well as effectively mapping and detecting various body parts from the lower resolution noisy pressure signal and uh, tracking these body parts over the time tracking the uh, corresponding pressure value over the time uh, so uh, even when those parts are not in contact with the um, pressure mattress so uh, we propose two different uh, approaches in the first approach we use computer vision techniques to uh, basically uh, um, track, uh, uh, sorry, detect the uh, body posture from the pressure images and then track them, uh, the body parts over the time. Uh, of course, the problem here is that these pose estimation networks uh, are uh, based on um, optical data, developed based on optical data. And so uh, like these optical data have higher resolution. They are, uh, they have more visual cues such as textual information, so on, which the uh, pressure signal does not have those type of uh, information. So on the second um, uh, solution, we basically uh, use signal processing approach. And then we uh, the first step was detecting external objects from the uh, pressure signal by uh, the detecting the, um, uh, by basically analyzing the uh, signal uh, properties. And then from that, enhancing the signal after that, uh, automatically detect the body pose from uh, uh, by classifying based on the uh, shape features of the pressure signals. And then from there, we start wrapping up. Yeah, okay. And then from there, we basically uh, detect the body parts and then track the values over the time. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nassim. Questions for Nassim? And, and, and I'm going to start. This is uh, very exciting. I, I, I love to see how this uh, project has uh, uh, developed. What if the person ha is covered, has a blanket on top of them? How do you deal with that? Exactly. So the blanket on top is not uh, as problematic as having a pillow or wedges on the pressure mattress because basically what we are um, uh, like recording is the surface pressure, which is the pressure uh, like with the skin um, and the, like uh, the underlying structure, which is pressure mattress here. So blanket on the top is fine, but then like if there are some like sheets or some like other structures on the pressure mattress, the first step is of course removing that. And it is quite novel, like to the best of my knowledge, no one really has tried to basically remove this type of inf uh, like uh, unwanted um, information from the signal before, so. That's great. Uh, Craig, you got a question? 
Yeah, that's a really cool approach. I'm just wondering, are you using sort of deep learning approaches for your essentially what becomes some, some kind of pose estimation of the exactly. pressure data? Yeah, so like our first solution was using the, the deep learning like pose estimation networks, but deep learning based pose estimation networks. The problem, as I said, is that like those networks are uh, like developed specifically for optical data for RGB like videos. And then like the, because the, the nature of the data are different. So there are some like issues here. Of course, we can uh, like uh, retrain those networks or do transfer learning here. Uh, again, like the problem is that we do not have uh, like enough label, uh, like training data, and this is going to be like an expensive task like regarding the time and stuff. Uh, also, like uh, we like basically detecting the body parts from the pressure signal is not always quite straightforward because of the like visual and the resolution problems. Beautiful, Nassim. I know, Bernal, you have a question. I am going to have you stay to the end, uh, but I'm glad that you're very engaged. Um, thank, you. thank you again, Nassim. Yeah. Our, if you can stop sharing, there you go. Uh, our next um, uh, speaker is Ida Veliviskis, and I think I killed your name, but um, hopefully you will <laughs> pronounce it a whole better than me. Okay, um, so hello, my name is Ida, and I'm excited to share with you today some results from a qualitative study exploring rehabilitation practitioner experiences with transitioning to telerehabilitation services during COVID-19. As we know, COVID-19 quickly caused many institutions and services to shut down initially, including virtually all rehabilitation clinics, both private and public outpatient clinics. So the objective of this project was to better understand how we, as rehabilitation scientists, could better support practitioners in their delivery of telerehabilitation and base our future work on practitioners' experiences. So I conducted semi-structured interviews via Zoom with 24 rehabilitation practitioners from Alberta. Most were physiotherapists, but I had the chance to speak with a variety of practitioners from Allied Health. I had a good representation of urban and rural practitioners and most were female. As the quote states at the top of the slide, the transition to offering telerehabilitation services happened very quickly. And for most, it was a completely new method of delivering care. Clinics worked hard to set up virtual care and were up and running offering telerehabilitation services within a matter of days. So the overarching theme that came out of the data highlighted how continued access to care was the goal for transitioning to telerehabilitation. Although the transition happened quickly, by no means did it happen smoothly, far from that. Three main barriers to telerehabilitation were first, access to technology and internet bandwidth. Second, IT support for the client, which routinely became the responsibility of the practitioner and used up care time. Third, practitioner confidence in conducting initial assessments virtually without standardized tools or prior training. So although there were barriers and challenges, I found that there were many more benefits reported with the transition. Some of the benefits highlighted here include easier scheduling of interdisciplinary meetings, um, increased client accountability for their own rehabilitation, access to group programming for clients who work, access to a new rehab advice line for individuals to call in with musculoskeletal concerns, and reduced travel times to clinics for both rural and urban clients. Uh, so from my interviews, I took away that there are many ways in which we can support telerehabilitation. I will leave you with one um, that has come up the most, which is how do we do better virtual assessments? So thank you for listening and I'll gladly take any questions, comments and feedback on my research process because who knew that COVID would make me a qualitative researcher, um, but I've really enjoyed learning this new research methodology and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ferguson Pell, Dr. Vetti and SC Innovations for giving me this opportunity. Wonderful, thank you very much, uh, Aida. Questions for Aida? I'll start off by saying, what are your ideas? So, so it's, it's actually wonderful to hear that uh, there's a, a clear need for a quality, quantitative assessments mm -hmm. through telerehab. What are your thoughts about how to do that? Yeah, definitely. So for my conversations, I guess there are already like a few assessments that have been validated virtually that clinicians use uh, routinely in clinic. Um, and what I got is that they would just like to see more of those assessments um, become validated for virtual use. Uh, so I guess just going through, you know, the general validation process for standardized assessments. Um, and then 
uh, yeah, have those available and then also have like the training available on how to conduct assessments virtually. Um, Cause that's where clinicians really experienced, felt like they weren't confident. And obviously with their training, they didn't have that um, from their training. Um, and then the shift happened so quickly that eventually like months down the road, they did get some advice and shared with other colleagues. Um, but I think that's like a big gap right now and would be really beneficial. Okay. And was there any hesitation to the use of technology, new technology, or um, what was the attitude along those lines? Um, honestly, uh, there wasn't any much hesitation. It was more so that a lot of clinicians don't really know what's out there to begin with. So I would ask them like, well, what would you like to use? Like, is there anything out there that you'd like to have access to? Maybe AHS isn't providing it. Um, and really, they just were like, either like, I don't really know what's out there. So I think it's maybe our job to also reach out to practitioners and kind of introduce them to what we're working on and bridge that gap a little bit more and uh, make them more aware of what's like in the coming down the pipeline. Um, and also another good feedback I got was practitioners are all, uh, often like very overwhelmed with like a lot of maybe new information and they're really busy and they're overworked. Um, so it's really important to have like plug and play technologies that are super simple to use. Like it's not a steep learning curve. It's very basic um, that they can just like take right away and be like, get some quantitative outcome measures or something like really yeah. quickly and really simply. Wonderful idea and perfect, perfect timing all around. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Roman Fatian. Roman, make sure that you're unmuted and you're sharing. We're seeing a mountain in an we're seeing an island. There you go. Now you should see it. All right. So what we want to do is measure, control, and improve. Personal hygiene directly affects our wellness, and we all know that uh, monitoring personal hygiene is not easy. People touch their faces more than 20 times per hour on average. Even during COVID-19 pandemic, the number of face touches is still high, which could increase the risk of getting infection. It was observed that even people suspected to have COVID-19 touch their face more than 15 times per hour on average when they are waiting for the COVID-19 test. Well, it seems not touching face is harder than it sounds. So there is a necessity of accompanying personal monitoring system to remind avoiding these high risk activity in the form of feedbacks. We have, a we have developed a solution which make it possible to monitor the face touches, control and improve these habits. Our solution is an expensive, accurate and easy to use technology which can uh, which can monitor your habits and help you control and improve it. AI-powered face touch detection technology, which could be employed on any wrist-worn sensor. The way it works is each time that you touch your face, it, it, face, it detects the face touch and gives you feedback. The feedback mechanism helps you to change the face touch habits. Now the question is how it detects the face touching. Well, inertia data representing hand motion is obtained from the wrist-worn sensor, which could be Apple Watch, Fitbit Band, or any smart uh, wearable. Then similarity of hand motion and face touch is investigated using, using dynamic time warping technique and detects whether, whether it was a face touch or not, or not using a trained KNN model. We validated our solution during both stationary and non-stationary activities. A stationary activities uh, means when you are sitting somewhere and working with your computer, your mobile phone, or doing any other activity. And non-stationary activity means when you are doing your daily routines like walking, cooking, drinking, or doing any other activities. And it should be said that uh, when we were uh, investigating the, the accuracies, the confounding motion to the face touch, like fixing the glass, touching the, face, uh, touching the head, reaching and picking the objects on like uh, top of the head, like on like different variety, variety of the position was tested. It was observed that our solution provides 89% accuracy, 98% precision and 92% sensitivity during the stationary activities. 
and 79 accuracy, 79% accuracy, 88% precision, and 79% sensitivity during the non-stationary activities. As a result, our solution could detect and monitor face touches accurately and help individuals to control and improve their face touch habits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. Uh, questions for Roman? Um, uh, well, well, people are thinking, I'll ask you my uh, first question. Um, a nice uh, application. Have you, um, have you gotten feedback as to what the users think or, or potential users may think uh, about this application and how they interact with it? So uh, basically the way that feedback mechanism works like comes with some uncertainty, like it should be investigated how effective the, the feedback system is. But like considering like the other feedback system that like we see in like the technologies provided, for example, the, the number of walks or like the duration of your activities that you, we see like in the commercial devices, we, we could say that like they have a, a, like enough um, uh, like effect to improve the, the, like this habit or any other habits. Okay. And um, yeah, what is the immediate next step to move this forward? So like the immediate next step is like we developed the, the algorithm, but uh, like the, the user interface and like other parts are not ready yet. So we will work on those parts and, uh, and like get those parts prepared. Okay. Yeah, it'd be great to kind of get um, a user input and, and see if uh, there's any um, uh, changes in direction or you, you could incorporate other things uh, into that uh, app that would allow people to use it even more effectively. Yeah, then, then like we can monitor them in a long-term pattern and see like whether the changes were significant or not. So yeah, that, that, that could be the next step as well. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Raman. Yeah, and uh, let's see how I can. So just stop sharing. Yeah, just uh, click on the red on top. And our next speaker is Bernal Manziniali. <laughs> uh, sorry. I, I killed your name. My apologies. That's all right. Uh, hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Bernard Manzanilla. Uh, automated fluid presence in the lungs uh, uh, doing ultrasound imaging is basically what we will talk here. You can see my supervisors on the bottom of my slide. Uh, so let us begin. Uh, it's not advancing. OK, yeah. So uh, influenza is ranked seventh in the lethality account uh, for Statistics Canada. Thus, fluid identification, which is associated with pneumonia and influenza, is uh, critical, apart from the pandemics. Ultrasound radiation uh, is basically is safe. It's only acoustic waves, and it, uh, ultrasound is portable, as you can see on the bottom, uh, the image in the background. Improvement for image quality means uh, better uh, diagnosing. So we uh, basically aim at that at uh, this project. Uh, we had a three-stage uh, plan for this. Basically, the first part is a long sound wave propagation image artifacts to, to understand how the waves propagate in the lungs and what the images represent, because it's not tissue, it's actually waves. Uh, image reconstruction then, which is the second step, we, which I will show in this presentation. And then a third step that, uh, for the future is to infer tissue properties from the images. Uh, well, yeah, this is what we have here. Uh, so basically, one of the main artifacts in long ultrasound is what is called reverberations or multiples, which is basically an echo that presents itself in between the muscle and the chest and the pleura. Uh, this is what you can see here as repetitive lines that are indicated with red arrows. On the left-hand side, uh, however, what you can see is a long uh, fluid consolidation, which is basically the presence of pneumonia-associated fluids in the lungs. The dark portions of the image are associated with, rip, uh, with the rib cage, where the sound waves are totally reflected back. So uh, I show here uh, first uh, algorithm, which are basically one of the three I will show to you. The first one is called fast uh, iterative shrinkage uh, thresholding algorithm, and this algorithm is working in the Fourier domain to uh, basically select which are the frequency contents of the image and to try to increase the image quality by reducing the noise. You can see that actually this algorithm doesn't perform that well because it blurs the image a little bit. So next, uh, wh what I did was to use uh, the same algorithm, but with a different uh, transformation. Instead of using uh, Fourier domain, what I used was radon transform. Uh, and by limiting the number of projections in the sinogram, uh, which is basically all the angles at which we're observing the image as in a tomography, 
we can enhance a little bit the frequency content of the image. So you can see more details. However, the noise is boosted. Uh, this is finally the algorithm I propose, which is basically an ADMM or alternating direction method of multipliers algorithm using uh, a total variation the convolution of reconstruction, which is going to help us uh, enhance, increase the resolution. Now you can see here uh, the increase in quality of the image, which is basically the two details. Uh, the left image is basically the initial image and the right image is going to be the output image. But now I need so, you to stop wrapping up. Yeah. So uh, the takeaway message is we developed three algorithms basically for uh, a resolution increase in images for better diagnostic, either with deep learning or a manual. And the last one, uh, the third algorithm is the one we propose and we put forward. We want to characterize the long propagation uh, of the waves and we want to uh, estimate the tissue properties from the ultrasonic images. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for Bruno? Uh, I'll start off. Have you had the chance to, well, Eric, let me, let me have you go first. Sorry, my video may be catching up. Nice work, Bernal. I, I appreciate it. So I'm wondering, are you saying that you're, you're going to do something like um, what you do in x-ray or CT imaging, which is understanding the attenuation or the scatter through different tissue types? Is that what the last bullet point in that takeaway is? Uh, it is actually, uh, in fact, more exciting. What it means is that we can actually estimate the, the tissue properties directly from the ultrasound. Uh, I, I know I sound like uh, I'm selling a car, but, but I'm not. This is actually what we, what, uh, what we like to put forward. Uh, this is actually used, uh, my, my uh, previous background comes from the uh, acoustic imaging for the oil industry. And this is done customarily in the oil industry where you have no access to probably a reservoir, which is kilometers below the earth. And what they do is they estimate the hardness of the rock uh, by using only acoustic waves, which is basically like a gigantic version of ultrasound in this case. What we will do there uh, is basically what is called full waveform inversion. There is one paper in Nature, which I can recall that does do that for uh, tissue. That's for the brain. That's a paper in Nature that I can then later share the reference probably with Vivian or Michelle, and she can uh, broadcast the reference. It's a quite interesting paper. So what they do is they basically use ultrasound to estimate the tissue properties in the brain uh, directly. This is this is the core the core of uh, the goal. This is, we're not there yet. Yet we want to get it there. Great, thank, thank you. you very much. Exciting work, uh, and thanks for the question, Eric. All right, our next speaker is joining us from the airport. Therefore, he sent his video and I will share my screen uh, so that you can see his video. Let me just see. All right, I hope uh, you guys are able to see my screen. Someone unmute yourselves and tell me yes or no. It's not showing, Vivian. No, Vivian. It's not showing? Nope. Okay. Is it now working? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So we'll start right now with uh, Mateus Musi. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really sorry that I couldn't participate in this event live, but I thank you very much for the opportunity of allowing me to present this project. And my name is Mateus Musi Musi. And we are going to start now explaining why this project is important. So children with disabilities, they miss a lot of opportunities due to their disability and participating, especially in play. And their conditions sometimes um, don't allow that assistive technologies, traditional assistive technologies help them. And that's why brain computer interfaces come to play. Those devices, they interpret brain electrical signal and they help them to uh, realize some tasks to accomplish some tasks. But because of the accuracy of those brain computer interfaces is not always um, as high as needed, hybrid brain computer interfaces are an idea that's emerging. So using multiple inputs um, may improve the performance of those systems. So what we're gonna be doing in this project is basically develop and test hybrid brain computer interfaces. 
And the way that's going to happen is that we have a display in a monitor that's going to show an SSV penis pre-300 paradigm at the same time. The brain is going to um, generate the waves uh, while looking at those stimuli. And then those uh, two responses are going to be detected by our system and then classified. And the classification is going to be used for uh, realizing different types of uh, activities. The way our display is going to work is that we are going to have uh, three different uh, blinking elements that are going to be blinking at different frequencies. Uh, that's the SSVP component of it. And then we're going to have a blinking uh, border, which is going to be uh, changing locations at different times, which is going to be the P300 stimulus. This product is going to be tested in two stages. In the first stage, we're going to test the system with adults with and without disabilities using a user-centered design. And we're going to iteratively ask them how we can improve the system. And then we're going to try to implement all of the changes they, they uh, indicate. And then once that system is uh, improved, we're going to test it on, on the second stage with children with disabilities and that we're going to use a single subject research design. Um, and then we're going to see if the hybrid reset compared to a single input brain computer interface actually had any improvements. And then once the system is tested, we can start testing it uh, in different sites. So the ICANN center on the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital will be probably the first one where clients can test the system and see how it goes. And then we have other two partners in the BCI Canadian network, which are located in Toronto and Calgary. Other than that, we're also interested in maybe offering the system to um, companies that are focused on clinical or gaming purposes and see if we can uh, apply this technology for any of those purposes. So before I end this presentation, I would like to acknowledge all the foundations and institutions that have helped uh, this project so far, the Smart Technology Innovation, the Glen Rose Foundation, and the Alberta Innovates through the Sport Support Unit. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Matthias. Probably you can join us now um, from the airport. There you go. So questions for Matthias. Am I hearing a question? Sorry. Okay, so let me start off. Uh, Matthias, what do you expect to see the difference to be between adults and uh, children? Um, and what would you learn from adults that you would then apply to children versus why not start with children to start with? Yes, that's a pretty good question. Actually, we're starting with adults just for the, um, I guess, the easiness of getting their feedback because sometimes children, especially if they have disabilities, it's a hard time to actually um, understand what exactly they will want to change. And that's what we're trying with adults with disabilities as well. So we can see if they can bring us maybe some perspective that can also be reflected on children with disabilities. And the difference in between adults and children, um, it's basically for the response matter, but the fact that a uh, system either for adults or children is effective and fast because of the endogenous uh, nature of the stimuli. We, we should just look at it and your brain responds automatically. In, uh, yeah, that's, that's very nice. Thanks, um, uh, Matthias. Uh, I was wondering as you were talking if, if there are um, uh, a type of activities that you could incorporate from the first talk, from Jennifer Bertrand's talk. I, I don't know if you were uh, able to connect at that time um, of um, uh, using um, um, her approach. Right, to, to uh, combine with your approach for also providing the ability to evaluate um, uh, cognitive and motor function. Um, I mean, we, we might, because what, the, what our system is doing is basically defining which target the, the person is focusing on. So maybe with the, with the different types of motion, if the person looks at the object first and then, um, and then grabs it, Maybe there is some relation we can get out of there. It might be, it might be a put. That certainly would be interesting. All right, hey, uh, Matthias, safe travels. I hope you can stay with us until the end of the session for yes, additional I'll questions at the end. All right, yep. wonderful. Perfect. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Roman Papian again.
guess you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Awesome. So in this presentation, I will talk about in field assessment of risk of repetitive strain injury of shoulder in wheelchair users using variable sensors. Individuals with neuromuscular impairments such as spinal cord injury frequently use a wheelchair for ambulation because of uh, their impaired working function. In Canada, we have 86,000 of individuals with spinal cord injury and 3,400 new cases each year. Manual wheelchair propulsion is physically demanding and can increase the risk of repetitive strain injury of the shoulder, yet this is possibly uh, preventable. Up to 70% of manual, uh, manual wheelchair users have reported shoulder pain, which could further impact their quality of life. So the aim of this project is to, do, to reduce the prevalence of shoulder injury. The forces applied to the hard and soft tissues of the shoulder joint are associated with the risk of repetitive in, uh, strain injury of the shoulder. Previous studies have clearly illustrated an uh, uh, association between propulsion-related parameters and the risk of shoulder injury. For example, it is recommended to decrease the propulsion frequency, uh, increase the push angle, and use smooth semicircular hand trajectory over the pushing to modify the full forces applied to the shoulder joint tissues and thus lower the risk of shoulder injuries. A range of instruments is needed to assess these parameters. Motion capture camera can be used to study hand and arm motion. And uh, like in addition, a force measurement device called smart wheel can be used to measure forces applied to the push stream, which enables the calculation of applied force on the shoulder joint via inverse dynamic. Although the, the results of these instruments are accurate, they are not available to a majority of wheelchair users for ongoing risk assessment. Therefore, there is a need for an alternative and accessible solution to monitor the shoulder motion by mechanics and reduce the risk of shoulder injury for the wheelchair user. A variable inertial sensor or IMU have the potential to measure these parameters uh, instead of the cameras and smart wheel, IMUs are accurate, easy to use, and inexpensive. IMU, uh, like using the IMUs, we have the opportunity for long-term monitoring of the patients in their national, natural environment and using their own wheelchairs. Finally, using the IMU, we can measure the propulsion-related parameters, control the risk factors by real-time feedback, modify the propulsion, and decrease the risk of shoulder injuries and like, as a result, improve the life quality of the wheelchair users. Thank you very much. And yeah, any question? Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. Questions for Roman? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, for sure. Of course. Uh, Roman, uh, how do you calculate or measure the force of the human over the wheelchair? Like you said that you have IMU and you're using maybe acceleration data. So, so there are a couple of criteria to, cal to calculate those values. So we will find, so basically we are going to place a couple of IMUs on the wheelchair, IMU and uh, like the lower hand and upper hand, hand and like then we can calculate uh, the, the, the acceleration that we have and also like the, the, the joint angles that we have and like the, uh, the rate of uh, change in the, the angles. And then using those ones, we will find the association between the, the parameters that we are going to calculate that we are not at that stage yet, and then compare it to the smart field and see whether they are correlated or not. Well, like in, in general, we want to use the, the, the joint angles, the acceleration, and also like the change in the joint angles and estimate such a uh, like forces. Yeah, I ask that because if we want to use like position data using by getting like uh, the, like the time derivative of that is like noisy. So maybe you need to focus more on like acceleration um, sensors in IMU. Yeah, th that's right. Uh, and also like the, like working on the trajectory does have like other uh, uh, like challenges that could, that should be solved. For example, like the, the error of integrations and everything. But yeah, yeah like we consider both uh, like all of these uh, uh, like assumptions and thank you for your uh, like comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Roman, what do you expect the user needs to wear? Or um, so what, what will the system look like for the user in, in uh, daily life? Uh, so like again, like 
IMUs could be like embedded in the like smartwatches or like even the uh, like the, the the textile that people can wear. So at the end of the day, we we, we want to like minimize the number of the sensors. So we will see whether we can like do like the whole thing using only one wrist worn sensor or not, which could be possible. And in case it wasn't possible, like we are going to place like like a couple of more sensors. Or we can use like the the the, the like the, the shirts and like the other things that have like the textile sensors in them. So we can also like grab those data from those sensors and like employ like employ those data. So uh, we hope that we can use it like uh, like we can uh, get the the the, the, the data that we need and like the estimations using one IMU sensor. But we'll see. Sure. Thank you very much, um, uh, Rama. That's uh, that's great. Uh, our uh, next um, and last speaker, but not least, is uh, Ahmed Shihata, and he is out of town. So we have um, a video that I will share, and um, and Rory is available to answer questions. So let me try my sharing again here. wherever you happen to be. Rory will now take uh, questions. Any questions? Any questions? So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start off. Um, uh, that, that looked uh, incredibly beautiful. Uh, what is the, um, yeah, what was the degrees, what were the degrees of freedom that were uh, in, included in the simulation? Um, I think that one was mostly 
just looking at the hand open closing, although it is possible to do the other movements, um, the wrist rotation, elbow flexion extension and wrist flexion, um, the shoulder positioning um, was mounted with an IMU, so it could follow the position of your arm as well. So you didn't necessarily need to do um, shoulder rotation. Right. I, I think that's what, what that's what I really what I was wondering whether the movements were more or less uh, natural. And Michelle, you had a question. Sorry. No, I was just uh, wondering what. Um, so is this meant to be operated in a rehab in, environment? So you've got all the equipment, all the. Uh, I presumably you're using EMGs to uh, control these things. Yeah, like I think in the demos, he was just using a joystick, but the idea is that you would use an electromyography band on the residual limb that the, the patient, um, the missing limb would be able to control the arm. Um, and then the first stage is yeah, to get it into the clinic in kind of a virtual reality space. Um, and then the next step after that is to see if we can use it for take-home training as well. Okay, thank you very much. That's yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Rory and, and the whole team. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how uh, persons with uh, amputations are uh, interact with that and what they think about that. So hopefully we'll hear more about that in the future. With this, we have our nine speakers. We have a few minutes to catch up with questions that others needed to wanted to ask, uh, but, uh, uh, but did not get the chance. So uh, I will give um, uh, the first question to, um, um, to Bernal because um, I, I cut you off uh, for one of the um, uh, talks. Are you, are you still ready to ask a question? Absolutely. So uh, basically, uh, I, I don't know if you, you, you specifically had a question, right, Vivian? Like uh, you, you had- uh, uh, so, there, so you asked the question of Moshaba and we did not oh, okay, uh, okay. get him to answer, yeah, but then you also had a question, you had your hand up after yeah. uh, Nassim's um, uh, question. Uh, so presentation so basically that. for uh, the first question was how do you interact with the with the mechanism like uh, for the case of the, the the person that is being aided by this mechanism is there any like uh, connection by via electrodes or anything that is reading or is it only like sensors that are uh, uh, you know moving the actuators depending on the pressure of uh, probably yeah. the, the, the joints or something yeah. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, now we are using EMG, so mm -hmm. we can have a kind of estimation from the muscle activation. Okay. Uh, and that that's one solution to to identify or detect the intention of user, like in what direction the person wants to move and how much is the activation of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that kind of like people should have a level of ability to make that contraction in their muscles. Uh, the other the other choice is kind of force or torque estimation, because we know what's the input uh, torque or force from our muscle and what's the motion response. Mm -hmm. So we can have a kind of torque estimator to identify what was the part of human interaction torque. And based on that, again, we can like control the exoskeleton, uh, I mean, motion or force either of them. Okay. Uh, yeah, but we can use like, EEG signals at higher levels, like maybe in the future. Um, right now, e EMG is our solution uh, to have a kind of intention detection. Okay, thank you. So um, the second question was basically about uh, like, um, in this case was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, pa pardon, I, I, I lost your, your name, but uh, Nassim, I think. Yeah, Nassim. Nassim. Nassim Hajari. So uh, the question was, uh, if there is uh, any algorithm in particular they use to enhance their signals, because I, I saw some interesting images of their their signals, and I right. just wanted to know what they're uh, they're doing. Yeah. yeah so like um, for the uh, first solution where we use the computer vision, we try to basically. Um, the, like transform the pressure signal into the form that is understandable by the uh, network. And so, yeah, so like we did log function and we did some smoothing and some thresholding to of course make it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But then for the second approach, we basically 
uh, the first step is uh, removing the external objects from the signal as much as possible. And then this is possible because the signal distribution for the external objects, and we showed that uh, like during our research, that the signal distribution for the external object is quite different from the like the way that the body yeah. is uh, like basically. So then, yeah, there are filters that we can use and we used, we basically tried like various uh, like signal processing filter, like the 2D filter. So like the, uh, the final uh, the solution was using Savitsky Golai filter as well as the Gaussian filter, and then the combination of the two could actually give us quite like promising results. Okay, wonderful. Do we have any other questions? I know we are slightly over time now, but um, um, just in case some of you need to go. I want to end up by thanking each and every one of you for an outstanding presentation. I really thank uh, um, you, to, you know, for going um, beyond the call for duty and preparing um, uh, um, videos for those who couldn't uh, be here in person and, and Mateus for being there from the airport. Uh, I also would like to thank your, your co-supervisors, your co-mentors for the uh, outstanding work that you are uh, doing. Uh, congratulations, uh, everyone. 